வணக்கம் வெல்கம் டு திஸ் செஷன் ஆஃப் த ஹேண்ட் சர்ஜரி குவிஸ் த ஃபன் வே டு லேர்ன் ஹேண்ட் சர்ஜரி question number 1 the gilulas arc that corresponds to the distal concave surfaces of the scaphoid lunate and triquetrum is the line 1 line 2 line 3 or line 4 and the correct answer is line 2 The concept of three radiographic arcs was first proposed by Louis A. Gilula in 1979. The first arc is a smooth curve around the proximal convexities of the scaphoid, lunate and the triquetrum. The second Gilula's arc represented by the blue dotted line is a smooth curve around the distal concave surfaces of the scaphoid, lunate and triquetrum and the third gilulas arc is a smooth curve that follows the main proximal curvatures of the capitate and the hamate a disruption of any of these arcs indicates a ligamentous injury or a fracture at that point as shown in this example of a fracture of the scaphoid bone question number 2 the arrow denotes which muscle the supinator the brachialis the anconius or the brachioradialis and the correct answer is the anconius muscle the anconius originates from the posterior surface of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and inserts on the superior posterior surface of the ulna and the lateral aspect of the olecranon of the ulna it is innervated by a branch of the radial nerve with a root value of c7 8 this small muscle has three main actions it assists in extension of the elbow here the triceps is the main agonist it supports the elbow in full extension and thirdly it prevents the elbow joint capsule being pinched in the olecranon fossa during extension of the elbow question number 3 what sesamoid bone develops in the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris and is therefore not a part of the wrist joint capitate lunate triquetrum or pisiform and the correct answer is the pisiform the pisiform is a sesamoid bone with no covering membrane of periosteum it is the last carpal bone to ossify it is situated within the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle and it articulates with the triquetrum alone the name pisiform derives from the latin pisum which means p which resembles the shape and size of the pisiform bone an interesting point about the evolution of this bone is that it is greatly reduced in size when compared with other non human mammals as you can see in the picture the red coloring shows the pisiform bone in the earlier mammals and it shows the size of the pisiform bone in the humans this reduction in the size of the pisiform allowed for more ulnar deviation and greater ulnar extension in the human wrist which increase the capacity for throwing there are other sesamoid bones in the hand in decreasing order of frequency there are two sesamoid bones in the distal portions of the first metacarpal bone within the tendons of the adductor pollicis and the flexor pollicis brevis there may be a sesamoid bone in the distal portion of the fifth and second metacarpal bones and there may be a sesamoid bone in the distal portion of the proximal phalanx of the thumb question number 4 which tendon is enclosed within its own synovial sheath in the carpal tunnel the flexor pollicis longus the flexor digitorum superficialis of the index finger the flexor digitorum profundus of the index finger or flexor carpi ulnaris and the correct answer is flexor pollicis longus there is a common synovial sheath surrounding all the finger flexor tendons together 
and this is known as the ulnar bursa and there is an individual synovial sheath surrounding the flexor pollicis longus tendon and this is known as the radial bursa. Question number 5. On T1 weighted imaging on MRI, dorsal wrist ganglia will show up as low to intermediate signals, intermediate to high signals, very low signals or very high signals. And the correct answer is low to intermediate signals. To understand this, we need to understand about T1 weighted images. On T1 weighted images, high intensity signals appear white and low intensity signals appear dark or black. The high intensity on T1 weighted images are usually from fat, blood or gadolinum which is a contrast material or protein. The black or low intensity signals are seen with air, calcium, cortical bone or rapidly flowing blood. Hence, ganglia which contain high protein tissue will show up as low to intermediate signals on T1 weighted images. On the other hand, the characteristic of a T2 weighted image is the high signal intensity of water. Pathology is often associated with edema or fluid and therefore a T2 sequence is very suitable to detect pathology. Here high intensity on T2 weighted images are seen with fluid, CSF, bladder, anything containing water or edema and low intensity is seen on T2 weighted images with air, calcium, cortical bone or rapidly flowing blood and it is seen as black or dark areas. Question number 6. 90% of the volume of the nail is produced by sterile matrix, germinal matrix, hyponychium or dorsal roof of nail fold. And the correct answer is the germinal matrix. The proximal part of the nail bed is the germinal matrix. The distal portion is known as the sterile matrix. The germinal matrix is responsible for 90% of the nail growth. The eponychium contributes to the shine of the nail. This eponychium is the part of the matrix on the dorsal roof of the nail fold. Question number 7. Who was the first president of the Indian Society for Surgery of the Hand? Dr. Ashok Sen Gupta, Dr. Murari Mukherjee, Dr. R. Venkataswamy, Dr. B. B. Joshi. And the correct answer is Dr. Ashok Sen Gupta. In the year 1967, on the sidelines of the Indian Orthopedic Association, a hand club was formed. This was a year after IFSSH, the International Federation for Societies for Surgery of the Hand, held its first meeting. This hand club was solemnized as the Indian Society for Surgery of the Hand on the auspicious day of August 15, 1973. And the first president of this society was Dr. Ashok Sen Gupta from Kolkata. The Vice President was Dr. B. B. Joshi from Bombay. The Honorary Secretary Treasurer was Dr. S. D. Pandey from Bombay. And the Honorary Editor was Dr. P. V. Joshi from Pune. Interestingly, the first council members of this society were Dr. M. M. Desai from Ahmedabad, Dr. D. D. Palande from Tanjore, Dr. A. J. Selvapandian from CMC Vellore, Dr. H. Srinivasan from Chengalpet, and Dr. Thangaraj from Salur. Question number 8. An example of controlled passive finger flexion protocol without traction of rubber bands is the Duran Hauser protocol, Kleinert protocol, modified Kleinert protocol, or Belfast method. And the answer is 
the duran hauser protocol it was about 1975 when the duran and hauser method that used passive flexion of the fingers caused about 3 to 5 mm of tendon excursion and this helped to limit the formation of peritendinous adhesions in this protocol immediately after surgery a splint is applied with the wrist in 20 degrees of flexion and the mcp joints in a relaxed position of flexion then within the splint with the metacarpal phalangeal and pap joints flex the dap joint is passively extended thus moving the fdp repair distally away from the fds repair and with the dip and mcp joints flexed the pip joint is extended and by this method both repairs move distally away from the site of repair and the surrounding tissues question number 9 a soft palpable fullness immediately adjacent to the cord at the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint in dupuytren's contracture is the houston sign the garrod sign the hugh johnson sign or the short watson sign and the correct answer is the short watson sign a soft palpable fullness immediately adjacent to the cord at the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint may indicate displacement of the neurovascular bundle by a pathologic spiral cord this is known as the short watson sign the hugh johnson sign refers to the distortion of the skin creases that can appear as a deepening of the crease or widening of the crease in dupuytren's contracture patients with dupuytren's contracture or disease can also present with garrod's nodules or knuckle pads located dorsally over the pip joints these suggest a higher likelihood of bilateral hand involvement one of the first symptoms of dupuytren's contracture is when the patient says he is not able to keep his palm flat on the table because of the contracture that has developed at the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint This is known as the table top test of Houston. Question number 10. When the metacarpophalangeal joints of fingers are flexed, the collateral ligaments are shortened, the collateral ligaments are stretched, the collateral ligaments get rotated or the collateral ligaments undergo no change. and the correct answer is b the collateral ligaments are stretched in the extended position of the metacarpophalangeal joint of the finger the collateral ligaments are short and hence very lax on flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint the collateral ligaments get stretched this is due to the peculiar shape of the head of the metacarpal which is cam shaped it is more in the antero posterior diameter and less in the proximo distal diameter that is the reason why the metacarpophalangeal joints of the fingers must be immobilized in a position of flexion so that the collateral ligaments are stretched if they are kept extended the collateral ligaments will be lax and then will undergo fibrosis and become shortened these shortened ligaments will not allow further flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joints i hope you enjoyed this session of the hand surgery quiz the fun way to learn hand surgery please comment on whether you found it difficult or easy and most importantly whether you found it useful and please scan this qr code with your mobile to instantly access the youtube channel to see the latest in learning hand surgery